We wanted to be a, a proactive force going out there and changing things rather than just taking what the cops or the prosecution dished up to us. We had a real strategy in those days to go out and actually make things happen. Well, first contact started during my university years when I was at University of New South Wales. Came interested because I met the wonderful Bob Belair at university who was then studying. Um, got talking to him, got quite friendly. Thought it was a pretty interesting idea of how to practice law and got some tips off him and actually volunteered for a couple of university holidays where I went and volunteered down at Scowls, the then South Coast Aboriginal Legal Service. Uh, you know, a week here, a week there, but it, it gave me a taste and I really thought it was, uh, it was wonderful and something that I'd like to do. And my very first job as a lawyer was with the Aboriginal Legal Service. Um, uh, I'll never forget the interview in the old um, ALS in Redfern and it consisted of however many directors there were there at the time. And I, My memory is about 15 but maybe it might have only been 10 or 12. And I sort of sat in the middle of this big room and everyone sat around the edges and just fired questions at me, um, which uh, I quite enjoyed. I didn't uh, really realise that was the job interview. I thought this was just the lead in to the job interview. And um, after about half an hour of me answering questions and talking about what I felt, one of them said, OK, you got the job. George Bandit Rose, because he was one of my chief uh, interrogators, I think, to use a um, not too uh, loaded a word. Um, Paul Coe was certainly there, he was running the show. Um, they were the two. Um, I got a feeling that Aggie Co was also there. So I started, I think the next week, this is January 1980. The principal solicitor at that time was Stephen Norrish. Um, so I started the next week. It was decided that I was going to be sent to Moree. But before I was sent there, and this is, you've got to understand, I'm straight out of college of law, never actually worked a day in my life as a solicitor. So I was quite grateful when they said, oh, you've got two weeks in Redfern to sort of get the idea of what this job's about. And I was uh, pretty pleased about that. Well, it was a very, very interesting um, first two weeks. It's actually one of the more uh, intense learning periods of my life. Um, because I, I did have the, the good fortune, I think, um, that Steve was the principal solicitor at that time, uh, an incredibly bright, smart, incredibly committed, but really hardworking fellow. And um, what I did for two weeks was essentially accompany him around his daily court runs. Now, in those days before the Downing Centre, uh, magistrates' courts around the city of Sydney were varied and many, and in all sorts of crazy little places, tucked you know down near the quay, down near Central. So there was a lot of at times distance to cover between court appearances and uh, after I remember on the first day after doing the first mention or plea at the first uh, site we were I think down near the quay we had to get up to central and uh, Steve eyes me up and down and says I hope you're a bit fit are you John I said oh, I'm not too bad I do a bit of bit of running as I did in those days not serious just jogging and he said good follow me and off he went at a jog and we jogged from courthouse to courthouse um, for two weeks, basically. Um, not a fast jog because we were carrying law books and bags and things, but there was these two puffing uh, <laughs> lawyers running around the streets of Sydney for a couple of weeks. So, anyway, uh, I learned a lot off Steve in those two weeks. Um, you know, you, when you've got a, a person who really knows their craft and knows, their, knows what they're doing and you're there with them while you're doing it, it is, it is almost in my book. The, probably the best way of being able to learn a new, uh, whole new way of operating like an Aboriginal Legal Service lawyer is. And I'll come back to that later. But um, at the end of the two weeks, I was told to um, go and report into um, City Ford car dealership where they had an account and tell them who I was and they'd give me the keys to a new car which I was to drive to Moree. It wasn't the, the Ford uh, Falcon GT 351s that were the, 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 the real um, yellow sharks. Mine was a, um, the f one and only version of the Ford Cortina they made with a big six cylinder in it. It was a real goer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it was yellow and it, and it was Ford and it went. Yeah. But that, that was in my Moree days, so my first posting to Moree. And there I met um, Phil Siegel, who was the ALS 
solicitor who I was going to replace. He, he'd done a few years in Moree and had requested to be able to come back uh, to Sydney. Um, and so I was sent up there as his replacement. But I had, again, the, the benefit of a, about, I think, two weeks of him there as well. Um, so then started a wonderful um, time. I spent two years at the Moree office. Then a, a very serious incident happened at Walgett. Our um, Walgett solicitor, John Terry, who's dear, dearly departed, unfortunately, uh, was a great mate of mine, became a great mate of mine. He'd been in the Walgett ALS office for a couple of years. Uh, Walgett was a very tough town with very seriously bad relations between Aboriginal people and police. And on one night, uh, John found himself uh, in a fist fight with a sergeant of police in the bar of the Oasis Hotel there. So I was directed to, rather than come back to Sydney, go to uh, Walgett and just fill in there for, a, it'll just be a little little time, John, until we find someone to go there. But when I got there and reported into the uh, Walgett office, of course, that was the uh, office run by the absolutely fabulous George Bandit Rose, who was only a small man, but by gee, he had more fight in him than uh, most uh, men twice his size. Um, he gave me a few clues about what to do and what not to do around town. Um, and uh, well, uh, I think I stayed there nearly four, maybe five months in the end before they did find um, the replacement. Um, and that replacement uh, in turn uh, went on to be one of my very long enduring friends for the a ALS, that's Michael O'Donnell, went up there as the uh, solicitor to follow me. But that's when I, I got the chance and did come back to Sydney. So I'm back in Sydney, I think, uh, this stage we're going on about 1983, 82, 83, yeah, 80, early 83. And um, came back and, and probably did about so only six, seven months in Sydney doing a lot of the more serious court work by then because, you know, people had moved on. By this stage, Steve and Norris had gone to the bar and soon became a public defender. I think it might have been Mark Smith who was the uh, principal solicitor at that stage. So I was back in the big city with the hard the hard crime stuff of, of the big city. Um, and there I was um, doing some pretty serious cases. And that was another very, very good learning curve for me. And um, that's the way you've got to approach the whole time in the ALS is that you never stop learning because there is so much to be done. I was asked to go to Grafton office. Um, again, another rotation was happening up there. And so I, I, I did gladly go because oh, this one's near the coast and there's a big river there. So uh, I'm a sailor from, from youth. So I thought this, this could give me a little bit of res respite. And then came back to Sydney and uh, because Robert Tickner was, um, had just got pre-selection for his federal seat in parliament and uh, had given notice that he was moving on. Uh, so they called me back to Sydney to become principal solicitor of the ALS and that was in uh, 1984 as best I remember. Um, you know, at this stage I, I, I'd only been a lawyer for a bit under four years. Um, didn't faze me because youth is a wonderful thing about being confident. Um, but I realised in subsequent years how much I didn't know when I went into that job. But gave it a, a real red hot go and uh, we had a really good team of of people back in the Redfern office by that stage. This is 84 going into 85, 86. Um, we had uh, some remarkable characters. We had uh, a fellow who'd come across from New Zealand, Christopher Lawrence, uh, as a lawyer. Tony Simpson, uh, who was uh, by that stage starting to work with Paul on a lot of the international stuff and doing very fine work uh, on that. Um, Michael O'Donnell found his way back to Redfern. He, he, would, he had become a, a real gun lawyer by that stage. Martin Hastor was there, who was a, a one of those gentle souls. He, he was particularly good doing children's court work and uh, family law. And Raina Pettit joined us, and that's where Raina, I first met Raina, was when uh, I think she started at the Redfern office around about 1984, 85, I think. But another person that's very important that comes on the scene at this time is John Borsick, who I um, recruited in as a volunteer student while he was just finishing his law degree, because I'd heard about him and he'd shown some interest. Um, he went on to uh, become, get qualified, become a lawyer and, uh, and go and actually set up the Newcastle office of the ALS and spent many years there and 
went on to do great work for the Aboriginal Legal Service Movement um, within Federal Attorney General's um, Department in, in latter years. So uh, there's some very important people from that, from that era, people who went on and did a lot of work subsequent, but were, were particularly good operators in their own right, even at that stage. We wanted to be a, a proactive force going out there and changing things rather than just taking what the cops or the prosecution dished up to us. We had a real strategy in those days to go out and actually make things happen. People were, were uh, even in those days, back in the 80s, getting prosecuted for um, killing uh, bush tucker in protected areas and we used to run, certainly used to run the customary law defence with, with some great success in the magistrates courts, I must say. Uh, I don't think some of those magistrates had a clue what it was that we were actually putting to them, but it sounded good enough to them and uh, probably, yeah, I probably shouldn't say that about them because, you, you know, who knows, they might have actually thought that it was law, but I had the impression sometimes that it was, gee, that's a good yarn, John, I think we'll give you the nod on this one. <laughs> a lot of magistrates suddenly had to do, and police prosecutors, suddenly had to do a whole lot more work than they'd ever been used to because all these black fellas up until then uh, just, oh yeah, well this is the police court, isn't it? That's what they still called it. That, my clients, anyway, they called it the police court. Oh, you've got to plead guilty. They, you know, they, it's their court, you know, they control it. You've got to plead guilty. No, you don't have to plead guilty. So there's that whole education of beginnings of the education, still ongoing. There's the whole education of the Aboriginal community of how the law was supposed to work, because it hadn't worked like that out there before. I go back to those early days. Um, when times get tough now, and I think, well, they, uh, they don't really approach how tough things were then. Uh, well, I returned in, um, in the year 2000 to the uh, legal service. So I had a, you know, after the Royal Commission, I, I had a, a good eight or nine years away, but I knew I'd always be coming back to the RLS. So in year 2000, um, in those, in at that stage, the year 2000, there were regional ALSs, so there was the six regional ATSLs operating. I, um, I, I was approached by um, Julie Perkins, actually, um, the manager of the Many Rivers Aboriginal Legal Service. Um, they'd just lost, uh, well, their uh, previous principal solicitor had just been appointed a uh, magistrate, Roland Day was his name. So they were looking for a new principal. So by the time, I think 1996 was when the federal government, and I was not in, you know, I was an interested bystander at this stage, 96, when the government basically said, enough's enough, we've had enough of some things that have happened um, in the ALS in, uh, in Sydney, um, and um, forcibly uh, regionalised it, and said, yeah, it's not gonna be statewide anymore. Um, go to your regions and, uh, and that's how we got the six regional ALSs. Really by the year 2000 when I came back to the ALS and, and we're in this regional situation, as you say, being funded through ATSEC, it was very lean pickings then, I've got to say. Um, I mean, you know, it was, uh, the flow of funding was okay in that you always got paid, but it was very, very small pay. Um, things haven't changed that much. Uh, Howard and his succession of Attorneys General and Aboriginal Affairs Ministers made no secret of the fact that he didn't think we should exist. We should be, our function should be uh, subsumed within the mainstream legal aid commissions, he was quite clear on that. And I actually regard the period from 2004 through to 2007 um, and the election of the Rudd government as the most precarious time because I really was in great fear that the ALS would not survive that and that we would simply become a sub-unit a sub of the Legal Aid Commission. And that's what the agenda was, I've got no doubt about that. That was actually our most critical time when I feared the most that the ALS would simply be wiped out and, uh, and not operate again. Ruddock decided that a way of going about getting us was to bring in this commercial tendering scheme. And what they devised was, was that for New South Wales, as indeed for other states, and Queensland in particular, they, they did this. They said, right, we're going to issue one contract for the provision of, Aboriginal, of legal services to Aboriginal people in this state right across. We're not interested in any part 
of the state's operations. We want one um, thing, one, one operation, one entity that we will deal with. And at first, uh, we in the regional ALS just thought, oh, they've got to be kidding. They're not really going to do this. I mean, they forced us into the regional in 96. Are they really going to force us back out into centralised again? And we didn't believe it, quite honestly, for the first year or two that this was being put by the Howard government. But then it became deadly serious. Look, the reality, I think, uh, was accepted that in order to survive, this is what we as the Aboriginal Legal Service in that collective loose sense had to do. But the real danger was then, and still remains now and into the future, is that legal aid commissions will be given, OK, you take out this over, you can run a, a service for Aboriginal people as a sub-unit of your operations, but that's where I see the great danger is, is that legal aid commissions will mainstream us. The most critical thing that would be lost would be the community say and the community veto, if you like, that operates through the board. The board is made up of, of, of Aboriginal people and they are from all of the areas of the state and they don't have particular legal or administrative or accounting expertise but they know what their people are going through in their own areas and they've got a very good idea of who's trying to sell them short. So what would be lost would be that really, I call it self-determination of the legal service. It would become a bureaucratic structure, they may have an advisory body or something like that, but in our structure the board actually makes the big decisions.